Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, we are going to start with Rage Against the Machine's favorite linguist, Noam Chomsky. And in particular, we're going to look at the Chomsky language hierarchy. Uh, this is made up of four different levels of languages here. Uh, this is something that people study in computer science undergraduate degrees. Uh, we start with regular languages and go to supersets of other types of languages here. Uh, regular languages correspond to regular expressions. At least actual regular expressions are regular languages. Uh, Context-free languages require a stack memory. And a lot of programming languages, their goal is to uh, make their grammars, not the full language semantics, but the parsing of the language be a context-free language. That's often very common for most of uh, most programming languages. Context-sensitive and recursively enumerable equate to uh, more sophisticated computation being required. And uh, that means if you're going to have a grammar be uh, context-sensitive or recursively enumerable, you're going to have a much more complicated uh, parser, which uh, might run slower and or have other issues, may or may not be easier for humans to work with. And we will look at an example of context-free production rules very briefly. But first, we're going to talk about the notorious, no, not B-I-G nor R-B-G, but notorious C++, uh, which is notoriously hard to parse. Quite difficult to parse C++. In fact, if I just search C++ is notoriously hard to parse, C++ is notoriously hard to parse. Notoriously hard and expensive to parse. Notoriously hard language to parse. C++ is notoriously hard to parse. Okay, we got the point here. But again, for the moment, we're going to pretend that we can make sense of it. Let's show an example of this context-free production rule here in the C++ uh, working standard, the working draft for the standard. Um, let's look at a relational expression here. This is the rule. And the production says you're going to have an expression on the left or an expression on the right of a less than, greater than, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. Or your relational expression might just be further down the tree of a different kind of expression, such as a compare expression, or a shift expression, or an additive expression. This right here is described in a context-free fashion. Uh, you just have any one rule has no context required to make sense of it. However, this is a lie. Here still in the C++ standard, we say, this summary of the C++ grammar is intended to be an aid to comprehension. It is not an exact statement of the language. In particular, the grammar described here accepts a superset of valid C++ constructs. Disambig disambiguation rules must be applied. Let's look at what this means. But we're going to start with JavaScript rather than C++. Here I've declared four variables, A, B, C, and D, with values 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let's print out an expression to the console. Let's print A less than B since we're on relational. Actually, that's not accidentally chosen either, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, Console.log a less than b. a is less than b, 1 is less than 2. This should be true. Indeed, it is. Let's print out two things to the console. Let's see if c is greater than d. 3 is not greater than 4, so we should see true and false over there. True, false. That holds as expected. OK, well, this is all fine and dandy. Let's move to TypeScript which isn't quite compatible with JavaScript. Let's run this here. Let's so far see if it works under TypeScript. Waiting, waiting. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Pistachio. OK, true and false, which is what we expected to see from JavaScript. However, let's make a slight change here. Usually, if I put parentheses around any old expression, I can put parentheses around this. Great, that's great. It shouldn't change the meaning of it. Let's put parentheses around the D and see what happens. All of a sudden, I have a parse error. Well, I have some kind of error. It's actually not a parse error. It's a semantic error. I have a mouse over it. It says, cannot invoke an expression whose type lacks a call signature. Type number has no compatible call signatures. It thinks I'm trying to call A as a function now. Because the TypeScript grammar says when I write this, it's going to be interpreted as if it were a function call to a generic function with type parameters. It sees this. A call to function A with argument D and type arguments B and C. However, A is a number and we can't call it as a function. Uh, let's change it to a function to see what happens. By the way, this is more... I don't know if the full uh, TypeScript grammar is context-free or not. 
but it's more so than C++. We'll see that shortly. Okay, we have a function here now. Since this is TypeScript, we'll want to have a type on our parameter here. X is a number, okay. So now we have A as a function. It's still complaining because we don't have type parameters on this. When you make it a generic function, we're gonna have type parameters B and C, which don't mean anything in this case, but they're just there to make it so this uh, can run correctly whether or not they're being used. Now our only error is that B and D aren't types because they're variables instead. Let's change them to types. Type B, type C, and in TypeScript, numbers two and three can actually be types. So now there's no errors anymore. If we run this, it's a called a function A with argument D, which is four. Four plus one is five. We should see a five over here now instead of true and false. And waiting again. I guess they're busy on their servers at the moment. Five, the five that we expected to come out now. Uh, by the way, there are ways to change the parsing here. If I put parentheses around the A less than B part, it'll go back to being treated as two separate uh, comparisons. Um, let's look a little bit at that, this parse tree concept here. We have our A equals one, B equals two, C three, and D four again. And let's start out with this console.log here. This is a TypeScript AST viewer. By the way, this is also up on GitHub somewhere. I don't have a link here on the page. I'll try to get that into the uh, below the video. So we have four different things here. We have a variable statement, one, two, three, four variable statements. And then we have an expression statement, which is our console.log. We're calling console.log with two binary expressions, a less than b and c greater than d is down here. That's how it gets parsed. You know, this is a TypeScript thing. So if we change our parentheses to go around the D here, all of a sudden it gets parsed differently. Instead of being two binary expressions, we have a single call expression. It's a call expression to A with two type references, B and C, and D is the argument now. Now, it's very important to point out here, that this is just showing the parse tree. It's not trying to figure out if there's errors in this. It doesn't say, oh, A is a number, you can't uh, call it. It's just saying, what's the parse tree? And in TypeScript, this is defined by this grammar of the language and doesn't care about what the types are. What would happen later, later on in the processing of the language is when we'd get the other error saying A is a number and not a function. However, we'll find this is very different in C++. Let's go to C++ here. Um, we have our example here. I have two log functions defined, one that takes one integer, one that takes two integers, just to make it so our example carries over easier. We also have a function A, which we're not gonna dig into quite at the moment, but it's very similar to our function from TypeScript. Let's first just get our uh, content here from our JavaScript. Uh, wrong tab, okay, here we are. Let's paste it in. Let's indent it so it makes sense. Let's change our lets to autos. Yeah, I could have said into there also, but I'll just leave it type inferred and get rid of the word console here. Okay, so now we're logging out a less than b, c greater than d. Let's run it. One and zero. One is true, because A is less than B, one's less than two. Three is not greater than four, so we get a zero, which is false. It called this function with two parameters. Let's see what happens, put the parentheses around our D here, like we did in TypeScript. No error. If we run this, it will behave the same as before, because C++ doesn't care only what we wrote, but also what the meanings of these variables are. We get a one and a zero again. A resolves to a number. Uh, C++ cannot parse, cannot parse my text here until after it knows what type A has. Um, that was a design, design decision they made uh, because they believed that would provide the best user experience. Uh, if we want to turn this into a function call, I can change the way it looks here. I won't change what it thinks it means. If I want to change this into an actual function call, I can hide the variable A. Now all of a sudden it's trying to call a function A, but it can't because just like before, B and C aren't types. Let's turn them into types. Just so we can uh, make this thing compile and run for us. And our errors are gone now. Now it's calling function A. We're ignoring these type uh, parameters. Oh well. And we're gonna return D plus one, which should give us our five like we had before in TypeScript. There it is. But the point here being, is that it required the knowledge of the type of A in order to even know how to parse this program. Uh, so this question got asked before on Stack Overflow, is C++ context-free or context-sensitive? 
uh, I'm not going to the details, but the popular answer here that was also accepted is that it's actually further up the Chomsky hierarchy than that. Um, they actually give an example here of how in order to parse, you know, the, to parse this expression correctly requires knowing whether this number is a prime number or not. Without knowing that, it can't even parse this correctly. Um, so point being that C++ is definitely not a context-free grammar. Uh, I want to go a little bit abstract out of here too and discuss actually the idea of abstract versus concrete notions, not just grammars being context-free or context-sensitive, but how much context do we need to, to know in order to understand what our program is going to do and what's better for people and better for computers. So for example, uh, there's a long uh, standing thing of like Java and C Sharp. It started out very similar, but Java, all your object methods are going to be virtual. And in C Sharp or C++ also, they're not virtual by default. Whatever the static type of your variable is, that determines what function is going to get called. As opposed to if it's virtual, virtual or dynamic dispatch, you have to know the runtime type of your object to know what function is going to get called. And this might potentially introduce extra cognitive load. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, coming to the idea of context, I also want to talk about uh, Jeff Raskin's book, The Humane Interface. I read this once upon a time. Jeff Raskin was involved in the original Macintosh design. In this book, he argues that a humane, meaning good for humans, interface is modeless. So like in the Emacs versus Vim war, he'd probably come out more on the Emacs side because Emacs is fairly modeless, whereas Vim is decidedly modal in terms of uh, insert mode or uh, command mode. Um, and Jeff Raskin's argument is that humans work better and learn better and operate more consistently in a modeless environment where everything always means the same thing. Um, might be true, might be false. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, talk to uh, psychologists or linguists, for example. And so the next question is human languages, natural languages. Where do they fit on the Chomsky hierarchy? And I did a little bit of searching around. I'm not a linguist. Uh, and I didn't find a clear answer to this. Some of it relates to whether you have infinite or finite capacity. I'm concerned more with the abstract notion of what's going on than your capacity. Uh, all current state-of-the-art methods in, well, the current state-of-the-art methods in natural language processing are based on machine learning, and they're all based on this transformer architecture that Google introduced in 2017. They showed it was better at the time than their competition, and it continues to be the core method of natural language processing for state-of-the-art today. Uh, and down here they have a picture of how this works. You might divide up your text that you're under consideration, might be a sentence or longer, into words, for example. And what the transform architecture does is it repeatedly, I'll have to wait for this to reset here in a second, is going to repeatedly compare every word with every other word over and over again. You might have seen like grammar trees for natural language in school before. And maybe such a thing can be done in some fashion, but you know, sometimes you need a lot of context to know how to interpret a human language sentence. And this is evidence independent of what other studies have been done that human language, at least in the abstract form, is not really uh, a context-free grammar type of way of looking at things, even though to some of the times you can pretend it is. The evidence here is that the best natural language processing people have to date in uh, artificial intelligence is based on comparing everything with everything. You get from I arrived to je suis arrivé uh, through uh, comparing all with all. And Google's actually got this kind of logic internal to its search engine these days as well. Anyway, uh, so what is best for humans? Context-free, context-sensitive, how much context do you need? What's natural, what's best? Uh, we'll probably have to answer more of that or at least discuss it further a different day. Bye, y'all.